Welcome back to a soon-to-be award-winning edition of Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, and with me in the studio today, as always, is Jared. He's behind the board. He's working hard. He actually has two monitors going at one time. Jared, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. You wearing your crossbreed holster? I sure am. All right, and I have my Super Tuck Deluxe holster on right now as we speak. And we've got a lot of material for you guys this week, so hold on to your hats. If you're driving, remember, two hands on the wheel, 10 and 2. And if you're listening to me at the gym, I want you to increase the elevation on that treadwheel, treadmill one more. Do it. Go ahead. It's all right. And if the kids are in the car with you, turn the radio up. Make sure they're listening good. Okay, uh, today, before we get started, what do we need to do? Well, we need to take care of some housekeeping. We want to make sure that we thank our good friends at Firearms Radio Network for being our bandwidth sponsors and bringing us on the network so that we can bring you all of the hope, peace, and love that we bring you every week. I want to thank our sponsors, Keltec Weapons of, Co- of Cocoa, Florida, and you can check them out at keltecweapons.com. And, of course, Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. We could not bring you Student of the Gun Radio without the generous support of our sponsors. So we want you to support them as well. Now, remember, guys, every single week we will pick a student of the week. All you got to do is like us on Facebook, and it's really ridiculously simple. You go to the Facebook machine and you type in the word student of the gun or those four words and you find us like us and if you've got a question for us and you think it's pertinent and you think it might be something that other people uh would have the uh, same question about and even if you don't put it up there maybe we'll use it and if we pick your question as the question of the week we will send you courtesy of student of the gun.com a free t- t-shirt that's right an official student of the gun t-shirt and uh, we've got three of them out right now there since the last three three weeks we've been doing this and jared why don't you go ahead and tell us who our student of the week is this week all right our student of the week this week is jesse gollicu sorry if i butcher that jesse and jesse asks I've been shooting for years, both as civilian and military, and have been told by everyone from my father to the range masters that you should know which eye is dominant and shoot from that side. What about the few of us that are left eye right-handed or right eye left-handed? Is there any truth to this age-old bit of wisdom? Jesse, that is an excellent question. And uh, for those of you who have been shooting for a long, long time, probably shooting 20, 30 years ago, uh, People never used to talk about eye dominance. We just kind of accepted that it was what it was. Well, professional shooting instructors uh, will tell you you need to know, especially if you're a beginning shooter, you'll find out what your eye dominance is. And they have different exercises and different tests that you can do right there to, you know, kind of determine which is your dominant eye. Now, for those of you who are really new to the show and you're like, what are you talking about eye dominance? Well, every human being is born with two eyes and one of them is naturally your stronger or your dominant eye. Just like you have a, you know, right or left-handed person, you have a, you know, one eye that primarily focuses in and you have another one that supports it. Now that could be right-handed, right eye. And most people assume that if you're left-handed, you're left eye dominant, or you're right-handed, you're right eye dominant. But that's not always the case. Now, what I discovered many years ago when I was working with the 4-H shooting sports program when we started out, that was one of the things that one of the first things they did with the kids when they would bring them in. Brand new kids, they have no bad habits built up. And that's a you know great thing about kids is they haven't learned any bad habits yet. At least most of them haven't regarding shooting. And we would find out what eye dominance they were. Now, regardless of what their handedness was, we would determine what their eye dominance was and we would teach them to shoot from that side of their body. Now, my daughter is a fantastic example of that. My daughter is left-handed, but she is right eye dominant. And so she does all of her sports activities, whether it's shooting a rifle or a shotgun or a bow, she does all of that from her right side. But if she's going to write a letter or use a fork or what have you, she uses her left hand. And what we found and what uh, the 4-H shooting sports found is it was much easier to teach kids, to teach new shooters, to shoot from their dominant eye side. And people are like, oh, that's bull crap, that's bull crap, because you already know what handed you are. Well, eye dominance is not a chosen thing. If I put a pencil on a table in front of you and I said, pick that up with your left hand, you'd make the decision, you'd reach down with your left hand and pick it up. If I looked at you and said, okay, 
B left eye dominant. Oh, no, B right eye dominant. Can you change that? Well, I can close my eye. Uh, no, I'm not talking about closing your eyes. I'm talking about you are naturally one way or the other. And uh, what we found uh, t- training military kids is uh, with the pistol, it's really not that big of a deal. With a handgun, it's not that big of a deal because you're punching it out. It's right in front of you. You have the front and rear sight right there. If you are a right-hander but you're left eye dominant and you're shooting a handgun, in order to line up your dominant left eye with the front sight, all you have to do is cant the pistol a little bit and it's right there in front of your eye. The problem you run into is if you're a rifle shooter. If you're shooting a rifle, yeah, and, and we, I've actually caught kids doing this, uh, they're right-handers and they're left eye dominant. I've actually caught them trying to cant their head over the top of the stock to get their left eye in line with the front sight. And what they used to do back in the old days when I came in, they're like, just close your left eye, squint it, close it, you know, wink or blink. Uh, But that is a, again, that is a deliberate action. And how are we teaching people to shoot? If you're teaching people to shoot what we call like shotgun instinctively, look at the target, look through the sights and so forth, you want both of your eyes open. Uh, and if you're doing a defensive type of shooting, if you're reacting to a threat or something, you're probably going to have both eyes open because the human animal wants to see the threat. It wants to know what's going on. So rather than do- trying to teach yourself to blink or wink or what have you, you're better off teaching yourself to line the sights up with your dominant eye. Now, that may mean that if you're left-handed and right eye dominant, that you'll have to teach yourself to shoot with your right side. Or it may mean the opposite. You're right-handed, left eye dominant. And uh, people are creatures of habit, and, they, and if they've been shooting for a long time, it may be uncomfortable. The best people to, sh- to teach is beginners. Teach them one way, and they'll learn and they'll excel at it. And I can tell you from hundreds and hundreds of young people who were fresh out of the gate, had no bad habits you know, ingrained, that they become fantastic shooters when they're taught that way. So if you don't have any predisposed notions, you're always better off lining up, you know, shooting with your dominant eye side. That's not that big of a deal with a pistol. It is more of a big deal with a rifle or a shotgun. And Jesse, I hope that answers your question and and, uh, didn't provide you with more problems and solutions. But uh, in general, if you had to ask me one question, if I was going to take a new shooter, I would teach them to shoot with their dominant eye side. That's it. Now, moving on, let's talk about this week on uh, Student of the Gun TV or studentofthegun.com. We did a lot of uh, material this week about, and as you're listening to this, you can still go to studentofthegun.com. You can read the articles and, and you can sign up for the newsletter. We're dealing with making the most of your available time and your available ammunition. And unless you're a millionaire and you can just go out, and even if you are a millionaire, if you had a million dollars of disposable income right now, you still couldn't walk into Walmart and buy 10,000 rounds. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It's how much ammunition is available and how much can you get. So when you go out to the range, you want to make the absolute most of every single round that you fire. Well, how do we do that? We do that by going to the range with a deliberate plan, not just getting there and thinking, well, I'm going to go to the range and I'm going to shoot 100 rounds. Well, well, 100 rounds how? Well, I'm going to generate, you know, there are people that go to the range and they generate 100 pieces of empty brass and they leave the range with the same amount of skill as they arrived with because all they did really was turn money into noise. And uh, in this day and age, well, in any day and age, but specifically this one, that's not the best way to go about it. Uh, if you talk to people who make their living shooting, professional shooting instructors, competitive shooters, what they will all tell you is before they go to the range for a practice session, we're not talking about just, you know, shooting tin cans off of stumps. You say, I'm going to go to the range today and I'm going to spend one hour and I'm going to practice. What am I going to do? Well, you need to go with a plan. And what we've done for you guys, because, hey, we like you, is we've come up with the one box workout. And we have a one box workout for pistols and we have a one box workout for rifles. And when I say one box, I'm essentially talking about 50 rounds of training ammunition. You get, you know, one box of Winchester white box, nine mil or 22 or 45 or what have you. You go to the range with a very specific plan. And what we've done is we've laid out the one box workout step by step by step for you. So all you have to do essentially is be dedicated, you know, be intellectually honest with yourself and be disciplined enough not to say, well, I'm really good 
at this one. So I'm going to shoot 40 rounds at what I'm really good at, and then I'll just use 10 rounds to do what I'm not good at. We don't improve by doing what we're already good at. We improve by doing that which is difficult until it becomes easy. So if you go to uh, studentofthegun.com right now, uh, you can go to our blog section. Uh, we have an article called One Box Workout for Rifles. We've got the, actually the, we have a part one and a part two. If you sign up for the uh, Student of the Gun newsletter, you go to the main page, you sign up. Uh, just for signing up, we give you the One Box Workout free report just because we like you. And uh, in addition to the the step-by-step report, there's also an accompanying video where I'll walk you through it as well. So when you go to the range to practice today, you don't have to go out there with two, three, 400 rounds and just, you know, generate empty brass. You're better off going out there and using every single round uh, to your advantage. Uh, that is how we improve, ladies and gentlemen. And we've gotten a lot of... Uh, questions and feedback uh, on our, our website. We've gotten, in, you know, people send in emails to info at student of the gun. Uh, a lot of folks have gone to the Facebook page this week. We've almost been not overwhelmed, but really impressed that you guys out there in the listening audience are obvious and girls too, are obviously paying attention. And uh, one of the questions uh, pertain to what's the difference between, you know, why cops carry guns and why citizens carry guns or, you know, do cops have the right to have this kind of gun and so forth? Well, unless you are in the United States military, unless you are a part of a military unit whose job or task it is to go forth, find the enemy, seek them out and kill them, unless that's your job. Guns are all used for the same thing when it comes to personal defense, whether you're wearing a blue polyester police uniform or whether you're wearing khaki shorts and a T-shirt and you're going to the grocery store, a firearm is used to defend your own life. And what I can tell you is from a legal standpoint, there really isn't much difference between you and a police officer as far as justifiable use of force. A police officer carries a gun because he uses that gun to potentially save his own life from a, you know, a felonious assault or to save the lives of other people or other, you know, another person who is in the process of being harmed. That's the exact same reason why you keep a gun at home. That is the exact same reason why you carry a gun as a citizen is to protect your own life and protect the lives of the innocent. So when it comes to it, people say, well, cops are allowed to carry guns because they're cops. Well, they don't give them guns just because they're cops or, you know, the cops don't go forth looking for bad people to execute them. They look for them to arrest them. And the reason they have guns is to protect their own lives and to protect the innocent lives of citizens. And that's really, from a legal standpoint, no different than you or I. Now, let's talk about uh, a, a justifiable police shooting that just occurred uh, hot off the wire. And we'll put the link up for you guys so you can look at it. But uh, in uh, we're back in Texas again. There seems to be a lot of shooting in Texas. Apparently, a lot of bad people, in there are bad people in Texas that need to be shot. Well, uh, this story comes from Fort Worth, Texas. And it's from the Star Telegram. And a Fort Worth robbery suspect dies after gun battle with police. Yay, team. One more bad person is uh, going to become worm food, and that's always a score for us, for the good people. But what the reason we wanted to uh, mention this is because the police officer in this uh, particular situation was shot uh, through the upper leg, and he sustained a femoral bleed. Now, remember we talked about before, good guys do indeed bleed as well as bad guys. A lot of folks think, well, I've got a gun, so if, if anybody bad comes, I'll shoot them down and, and you know, I'll be good to go. Well, sometimes you can win your gunfight and still end up bleeding. Well, that's what happened in this particular situation. The officer was attempting to affect the arrest of a guy who had just robbed a Whataburger, and the guy shot him. The police officer got shot through the leg. The police officer returned fire, shot the bad guy several times in the upper chest area. And what do we learn about handguns? If you want to make people stop quick, fast, in a hurry with a handgun, you shoot him in the upper chest. And that's what this officer did. But he was bleeding. And what he did, he had been trained recently. And it, the story says he was recently issued a medical kit. He took the scissors, according to the story, out of the kit, cut his own pant leg up, and it said he made a tourniquet to stabilize his wound. Yay, team, and that is good. We, and uh, A, he had the training. He was taught what to do, and that's really what saved his life. It said he's been stabilized, and he's expected to return to duty no problem. 
Now, you can make tourniquets out of belts and T-shirts and stuff like that. That's fantastic. But, folks, it's 2013. It's not 1984 or 1978 or 1969 in the jungles of Vietnam. We don't have to make tourniquets out of field expedient material. There are tons of tourniquets, ready-made tourniquets out there that you can use Quick, fast, and in a hurry. And we talked about this before. If you have a legitimate, no kidding, arterial bleed, you're having a bad day. And that's not the time to start searching for improvised stuff because while you're improvising, you're still bleeding. And what we've done, and we talked about this after the Boston bomb attack, and we're actually going to put up another link that it was an interview with some of the surgeons in Boston right after the attack. It's a very short video, but it's very valuable because they said that based upon the experience that we had in Iraq and Afghanistan, people used tourniquets to stem the arterial bleeding of victims of that bomb attack. And a lot of people are alive today because of that. And the surgeon basically said, he goes, the use of tourniquets in the field and en route to the hospital saved many lives uh, during the Boston bomb attack. So, you know, our, our task as student of the gun, providing you guys with the information that you need, the information and you know not only how to do it, but you say, okay, Paul, I'm with you. Drive on. I understand that I should do that. Where can I find it? Well, we've done several uh, different pieces since the Boston bomb attack. We put up links. We're like, hey, you can go here and get this. You can go here and get that. And people are like, well, I want something that's ready-made that I can put in my pocket and I can take with me all the time, anytime. I want to be able to put it in my purse. I want to be able to put it in my, my range bag. What can I grab and stick in there? And so what we did is we came up with a new product or, or you know, uh, it's called, we're calling it the pocket lifesaver. And essentially it is your life jacket. It is a, yeah, a fire extinguisher type thing. You know, if, if my house is on fire, would I rather have a great big red truck with hoses out in the, in front to put it out? Well, absolutely I would. But if all I have is a fire extinguisher, I'm going to use that. If I was laying on the ground bleeding, I would rather somebody come up with a great big backpack full of lots of good stuff to start fixing me up. But we don't carry those big backpacks with us every day. You know, when, when you go to, you never, and when you leave your house, you don't know what you're going to encounter. You might leave your house. Everything is great. You return home safe and sound. Fantastic. But that doesn't always happen. And it doesn't do you any good. I've talked to a lot of people since the Boston attack about medical kits, trauma kits, uh, what we call blowout bags or IFACs. And there's like, yeah, I've got one. It's in my truck. I've got one in my car. It's in the trunk attached to my pack. I'm like, okay, what if it was you? What if you were out at the movies, out at the park? out of the restaurant, in the mall, and your kit is locked in your truck and your truck is a half mile away. Well, it might as well be on the moon. If you or someone you love is laying at your feet bleeding to death and you're, tr- I mean, you're going to leave that person and you say, I've got an awesome first aid kit and it's in the truck. I'll be back in 10 minutes. Bleed slowly. Well, of course you can't. You can't do that. Now, you guys, why do you guys carry guns? Why do you have guns? Because because you want to be a police officer or you're trying to usurp the authority of the police officer? No, because you know, I mean, I'd rather have a cop walking behind me everywhere, an armed, uniformed police officer just follows me around. But does that happen? Is that the way it works in the world? No, it's not the way it works. Now, eventually, if there's a bad person and shots are exchanged, a policeman will show up or a paramedic will show up. But what do we do in that time frame between 911, dispatch, they come, and now I'm bleeding. So what we did is we put together, it's, it's very simple. It has a TK4 tourniquet. It's got medical gauze. It's got uh, duct tape. And you guys, are, you might laugh, but overseas for the last 10 years, our medics and corpsmen have been hooking people up and securing bandages with duct tape. And the stuff works. And then, of course, we also have a nasal pharyngeal airway. If you got an unconscious patient while you're working on them and fixing their stuff, fixing their arms and legs and what have you, you got to make sure that person has an open airway. And if it's just you, you can't monitor an airway and bandage a limb at the same time. You just can't do it. So 
Uh, the Pocket Lifesaver, if you go to studentofthegungear.com, you can check it out. Uh, if, if you've got the training and you're looking for something that you can carry every day, this, this may be for you. If you don't have the training, remember this, buying gear doesn't give you skill. But you've got the skill, if you have the skill already and you're looking for something to use with that skill, this might be something for you to look at. Now, this next one we're going to talk about, <laughs> let me take a sip of water before I dive into this guy. <laughs> you may have seen it. I just found it uh, on the Internet uh, just recently, but it was about a tourist that went to New York City with his gun. If you know anything about modern America, unless you have a, uh, a writ from the king up there in New York City, you don't get to have a gun. That's not the way it works. So Johnny Tourist decides he's going to go. He's a, he's legally armed in his home state of North Carolina. He goes up to New York to visit the World Trade Center, uh, you know, the site of the, of the atrocity and pay his respects and all that. He's getting ready to walk in there. He's got a gun on him. And so he says to the guy, oh, I see there's a sign that says no guns allowed. And he says, well, that's right. There is no guns allowed. And he said, well, what about uh, law enforcement or whatever? And, and, of course, they told him no one, no off-duty anybody is allowed to be armed because you might shoot the site of the World Trade Center. Or I don't know. So what does is, what is, uh, Johnny Tourist do here? I'm not going to – you guys can look it up, and we'll put a link up for you. But uh, So according to the story, he gets out of line, goes over into the, uh, like, lobby area, takes the gun out of his waist holster, sticks it in a cushion in the couch, under the couch, and goes back, gets in line, and does the tour. Well, guess what? He goes back 30 minutes later to retrieve his gun. <gasps> it's not there. What? No. Someone had come and sat down on it and said, hey, wh what am I sitting down on? Let me lift the cushion up. Oh, there's a gun. <laughs> a woman who was taking the tour sat down and discovered the loaded gun. And what did she do? She immediately contacted the police. What did they do? They immediately confiscated the gun. Guess what uh, Johnny Tourist is doing now? Well, he's uh, going to be extradited to face charges in from North Carolina to face charges in New York. All right. I'm not going to bash this guy too hard, but let's talk about this real quick. Uh, if if you're a person that carries a firearm for the preservation of your own life, where does that firearm need to be? On your body, right? Because you can best control the gun when it is attached to you. The moment it is no longer attached to you, you no longer have control of it. However, if you choose to detach it from your body, you're still responsible for it. If somebody finds it and they say, hey, this is John's gun, why is John's gun left unattended? Let's go find John and let's have a conversation with him. You're responsible, dudes. You cannot. This is I read that twice and I was like, the people just can't be that dumb. Well, apparently people can be that dumb, but you don't want to be that guy. If you find yourself in a position where you're armed and you walk, you're in a line to go into the whatever and you walk up and you see a big sign that says, thou shalt not carry firearms in here because we all know that shiny signs that say no, you know, gun free zone. We know that that's what keeps us safe, right? What? It doesn't? Well, in, in some people's minds, apparently in, uh, in, uh, Emperor Bloomberg's mind, the, uh, shiny placards that say no guns allowed are, that's what keeps us safe. Don't go to places that are going to disarm you. Well, I want to go there. Okay. But know this, you better go ahead and lock your gun up somewhere tight somewhere else and, you know, put your safety in the hands of others. I, just as a matter of course, deliberately don't go to places where I have to be disarmed. Why? Because I trust myself to protect myself better than anyone else. And you should too. So don't be like uh, Johnny Tourist here and, and stuff your gun in the seats of a couch. That's just, uh, that's, that's crazy talk. I don't even, uh, it hurts my brain having read that. Now, We've also, this week, we've received a lot of other questions, and you guys send in a lot of great questions, but uh, frankly, some of them really shouldn't be answered by Paul Markle. They should be answered by someone who has a law degree. And so what I did this week is I contacted my good friends at the NRA's uh, ILA, Institute for Legislative Action, and I asked them, I said, hey, 
my fans are looking for a list or a clearinghouse or a, a source for pro Second Amendment attorneys. Guys, not just, you know, your tax attorney who doesn't know anything about guns. We want an attorney that can actually you know, steer us through these loopholes and these traps, especially if you live in an occupied territory. If you live in one of the, you know, the, the occupied states, like, for instance, Colorado, Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, Maryland, uh, New Jersey, the list goes on. If you live in one of those states where they treat gun owners as second class citizens and, you know, potentially suspect criminals, you don't want to be making it up. Uh, about was it three shows ago we talked about our friend uh, in New Jersey who got a visit from the Gestapo banging on his door at eight o'clock on a Friday night. You know, let us in. We want to see your guns. And what did he do? Uh, he con- he called his lawyer, put his lawyer on speakerphone, and his lawyer walked him through it. His attorney walked him through it. And said, "Do they have a warrant in your house?" The answer is no. Okay, well then, the answer to your request to come in my house is no thanks. Uh, but. Here's the trick. When when they're beating on your door, when the Gestapo's beating on your door saying we demand entry, that's not the time to pull out the yellow pages and start searching for an attorney. <laughs> if you don't have a good attorney, uh, if you don't have their phone number by then, that is not the time to start looking for one. And in our Armed Living uh, DVD, we talk about that in depth. You know, sitting in the police station in handcuffs is not the time to decide I should find a good attorney to represent me in this justifiable use of force case. So what the, uh, what I got back from my friends at the NRA is there is a website out there and we'll put the link for you guys. It's called the shooters bar. Dot org and not drinking bar, but like a law bar or the legal bar. See a little play on words there that they did. And if you go to the, the shooters bar dot org, what they have is a breakdown state to state and they have uh, attorneys that are right to keep and bear arms attorneys. They're pro second amendment attorneys. And it's not always, you know, I just shot a guy who was trying to rob me in the Walmart parking lot. I need an attorney. It's not always stuff like that. It could be, for instance, I had a uh, a guy write in and say that he moved to Michigan. And in the state of Michigan, you have to have a permit to own a handgun. Well, he moved from another state where you didn't. And he wanted to be a lawful citizen. So he was going to register, or uh, you know, his handguns. Well, the, the, the letter that I got from the guy, and this is anecdotal, but basically it said that they, he called and said, what do I need to do? And they say, they said, Oh, come to the sheriff's office and you need to do this, this, and this. So he goes to the sheriff's office and said, Hey, I'm here to register my handguns. And they're like, Oh, well, you can't do that until you've been a resident for 30 days, but you also need to know that having an unregistered handgun in your possession is a felony. And, you know, it is, you know, his question was, well, what am I supposed to do? And my answer to him was, Get an attorney and have your attorney deal with them because that's their job. That's what they do. Uh, from my experience as a law enforcement officer, the absolute biggest disasters waiting to happen were people who decided that they were going to go to court and they were going to represent themselves because they were, they were right and you were wrong and I'm going to be my own attorney. Dudes. You don't do it. Even cops or P or other attorneys who have to go to court don't represent themselves. That's a, it's bad juju because number one, you're emotionally involved in it and your emotional involvement is going to cloud your decisions. So, and, and, uh, you know, I had somebody talk to me today and they're like, well, that's expensive, man. You can't just be hiring an attorney. <laughs> well, yeah, that is true. It will cost you some money. However, if you wait, until they decide, oh, you have an unregistered gun. We're going to arrest you and charge you with that. Well, now you're going to need an attorney because, but it's going to cost you a lot more. Uh, so I'm not telling you to run out right now and put a ten thousand dollar retainer down on an attorney. But what I am going to tell you is, if you are a law abiding gun owner and you carry a gun, or you think that I may someday have to use a firearm to defend my own life. Now is the time to find a pro Second Amendment attorney, even if it's just making contact with their office and getting their phone number. 
Put their phone number in your phone, put it in there twice, put it in, in there under their name, and just put it in there under the word attorney so you can find it quick, fast, in a hurry. Because like I said, after you've been attacked and assaulted in the parking lot and you know, you're, you're now you're sitting there in a police car answering questions, that's not the time to think, man, I should find an attorney. No, you want to have one before then. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, and, and people hate doing it because you think, well, I'm not a bad person. I'm not a criminal. Why should I have an attorney? That's not the point. It's immaterial. And when it comes to dealing with law enforcement agencies, bureaucracies, and so forth, you're better off having somebody who is a professional deal with them than just making it up as you go, because that is their job. So we'll put that up. It's the shootersbar.org. And uh, I want to thank my guy, my friends from the NRA's ILA for, uh, for, Put me in touch with those guys. Now, speaking of the NRA, if you're if you're a fan of Student of the Gun, if you're following the show, you should know what's coming up. What's coming up, guys? And you're all, you're off there in the audience. You're saying the NRA annual meeting in Houston. That's right. It absolutely is. And as many of you guys can, that can show up, uh, that would be fantastic. We're looking forward to seeing you folks. I think a lot of you out there are probably like, oh, I'm going to be there. Uh, if you want to come by uh, the, either the Duracoat booth or the excess sites booth on Friday. Uh, we're going to be uh, Duracoat in the morning and excess sites in the afternoon. We're going to be signing uh, copies of Student of the Gun. And on Saturday, we're going to be at the Keltec booth in the morning, and we're going to be at the Kiapa Firearms booth in the afternoon. Now, don't forget, Firearms Radio Network listeners, all of all of our friends, all of our fans, they're going to be doing a listener meetup at Lucky's Pub, and that's at 801 St. Emanuel Street in Houston, Texas. It's going to be uh, at 8 o'clock on Saturday night, and that is, of course, the 4th of May. And it's coming up quick, fast, and in a hurry. Now, in the United States of America in the last four years uh, specifically, we've had a huge influx of new gun owners, of first-time gun owners. And, you know, historically in the United States, gun people have been products of their upbringing. You know, my my great-grandfather was a shooter. My dad was a shooter. You know, my my great-uncle Jack used to take me hunting. You know, that's that's traditionally how Americans learned how to shoot. Now, obviously there were, there's always been, you know, there's been a a certain number of people that decide at whatever point in their lives, I want to buy a gun or I want to learn how to shoot. Uh, But in the last, you know, four or five years, the number of first time gun owners has risen dramatically, uh, particularly in the, in the, uh, uh, with women, but men too, and I've had a lot of people or guys that are, they, you know, they owned a 22 rifle and a shotgun, but they never owned a pistol or what have you. And now they're at the position where they're an adult and they want to learn, which is fantastic. I, and I, I get a lot of uh, emails and I get a lot of Facebook messages from people say, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, buying my first gun, uh, buying my first handgun or what have you. And what should I do or what should I buy or, you know, how do, how do I learn? Well, first and foremost, if you're listening to the sound of my voice right now, yeah, that's right, I'm, I'm talking to you. If you're listening to the sound of my voice and you're one of those people that are thinking, I'm thinking about buying a duty quality or a duty caliber handgun, a personal defense handgun, I'm thinking about it. Stop thinking and go buy it. Now is not the time to wait well, I'll get one eventually. Mm, no. If, if you, in your mind, if you really want to do it, do it. Now, how do we learn? How do we grow? How do we, well, you can do it the, the quick way or you can do it the slow way. The slow way is to buy the gun, talk to your friends at the gun shop, go to the local range, you know, rent an hour on the range, stand there and listen to every, you know, gun shop, gun show expert tell you how they do it and buy magazines and so forth. And eventually, through trial and error, you'll figure it out. But it's going to take a while. And that's the inexpensive route, and it's the convenient route because you don't have to leave the comfort of your own home or your own area, and uh, you can just do it once in a while, and you can slowly learn. And that's fantastic. But a lot of people are in, you know, right now think, well, I need to have a, a firearm for personal protection, and I need to know how to use it, not in the next couple of years. I need to know how now. Well, if you want to take the fast track to being a gun person, 
get your butt in a school. That's right. I'm telling you. And you're like, oh, that's easy for you to say because you teach classes. Brothers and sisters, there is nobody out there in the firearms training world that has become a millionaire. There's no, there are no Bill Gateses or uh, what's that guy from Facebook, that kid they did the movie about, whatever, Zuckerbergs. There are no, there are no billionaire Zuckerbergs in the firearms training industry. You don't make a million dollars being a firearms trainer. That's just not how it works. But uh, there are lots of good schools in the United States of America. Um, starting at the West Coast or the left coast, if you are in the People's Republic of California, you can go train with my friends at ITTS, International Tactical Training uh, School. And Scotty Reitz is the guy's name. Scotty's an excellent instructor. And if you happen to be in occupied territory and you want to get into a class, uh, check out ITTS out there in California. If you want to move into free America and actually be a citizen and, and train, you can go to Arizona uh, to Prescott to Gunsight Academy. And you want to train with those guys right there. Now, I'm going to get in trouble because I'm sure that somebody's school is not going to be mentioned. They're going to call me later. <laughs> but just off the top of my head. Now, if you are in uh, the Northwest, up around Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania area, you want to go to TDI Ohio or the Tactical Defense Institute in Ohio. Talk to my good friend John Benner up there. They will uh, treat you right and do a good job for you. If you want to go a little bit south of Ohio, south of you know Kentucky in the Tennessee area, check out tacticalresponse.com, and they've got uh, fighting pistol, fighting rifle, all kinds of uh firearms training classes, you can get in on one of theirs. Now, if you are, if you happen to be in occupied territory, you may be able to get in up at the SIG Academy or the Smith & Wesson Academy. I'm not sure what their availability is on some of their training courses right now. Uh, but if you are up in the Northeast occupied area, you might still be able to get into some of theirs. But I think pretty soon what they're doing, is, I think uh, Smith & Wesson Academy, Jared, that they're going to do a a single shot flintlock home defense course pretty soon. Uh, I think they're being proactive because they know that that's what's coming and they've got a, uh, a blunderbuss introduction to the blunderbuss and a, a, a flintlock fighting pistol class. So if you're up there in the people's Republic of Massachusetts or nearby, uh, you might want to dust off your flintlock pistol. Cause I think, I think you're still allowed to own that there. I'm not sure if you have to get a permit or permission from the commissar to own one, but, uh, you might now where else, uh, in Texas, in Texas, where are we going to train with in Texas, Jared? Oh, we can t train at the Texas pistol Academy and my good friend, Shay Niverson. If you are in Tejas in the, Dallas Fort Worth area and you want to train uh, with the Texas Pistol Academy look them up online the reason I'm mentioning this is look if you really no kidding want to get involved in the in you know shooting you want to learn you're better off getting in what I would call a full immersion training program uh, and you're you're way better off if you can book you know, a weekend, three days at one of these schools, because when you go there, rather than doing it for an hour and going back home and, you know, you're going to be training, you're going to be learning, you're going to be shooting for two days solid. Heck, a lot of people will probably go and uh, they'll probably shoot in two days more ammo than they've shot in their gun ever. Uh, most, most, especially new gun owners, they'll go out and they'll buy 200 rounds and think, man, that's going to last me a while. <laughs> <laughs> 200 rounds is is like the morning before lunch at uh, tactical response you know or just an afternoon session now if you're lucky enough john farnham who is a fantastic instructor he is also uh he's one of the few uh serious road shows uh if you go to uh dti defense tactics i think it's dti.com or Defense training, go to defense training.com, but just put in John Farnham, F A R N A M, and uh, look up John's schedule. Now, John actually, he's a, he's a traveling road show and he, come, he'll probably be in an area somewhere near you. Um, I know that uh, he gets, he goes to Indiana and Ohio and he travels all over the United States. So if you can get into a John Farnham course, uh, if he's near you, I would definitely, I would highly recommend it. You take it. Now people say, well, what should I take? You know, I, I went to this school and they've got eight different courses. They got a rifle course. They got a pistol course. They got a shotgun course. They've got, you know, they got a medical course. They've got all these different courses. What should I take? Well, A, you're an American. Do whatever you want. But 
if you are a new gun person, keep it simple. You know, say, well, I just bought, you know, a Smith & Wesson model M&P9, and that's going to be my home defense gun. Okay, great, fantastic. Then take a basic, you know, pistol 101, fighting pistol, you know, uh, gun sights class is called uh, the 250. You take their 250 course. It's your basic introduction to pistol. They're going to teach you fundamentals. They're going to teach you marksmanship. They're going to teach you firearm safety. They're going to teach you everything you need to know to begin on your path as a student of the gun. Now, know this. One class is not going to do it. If you're really serious, I mean, look at attorneys, look at doctors, look at anyone who's a professional. Uh, would you want a doctor working on you the, who's you know got their degree in 1982 and that's the last training they took? Or would you want, you want a doctor that every year goes to seminars and his material is up to speed? Well, obviously, you'd want the one who's the most up to date, right? If you take one single class and then you never take any other training again, yeah, you'll you'll be okay, but you're just getting started, and that's but you got to take that first step. Uh, I, I I know it's tough. I know times are tough, but hey. Human beings have to make decisions. You know, you are responsible for the life that you lead. And buying gear does not give you skill. Now, I had somebody tell me recently, uh, well, they didn't tell me. They sent me a letter. Uh, and they're like, you know, I don't, I don't need training. My father taught me how to shoot a rifle when I was 12 years old. And I was perfectly fine then. And I'm 42 years old now. And I'm perfectly fine now. Okay, fantastic. You know how to load a firearm, you know how to take the safety off, and you know how to press the trigger. Great, fantastic. If all you ever want to do is, you know, shoot soup cans off of a stump out behind your house, you don't need a class. You're good to go. Drive on, brother, and kill soup cans from now until the second coming. Fantastic. But, and here's the big but. The big but is this. If you think that you're going to purchase a firearm and you're going to carry it and you're going to use it in the most serious application that you could possibly undertake, saving your own life in a life and death situation, I'm pretty sure that your great uncle Jim, when you were shooting squirrels in the woods, didn't brief you on justifiable use of force or culpable mental states. Or any, you know, these are the things that you need to understand and know about. Anybody, you know, or not anybody, but most any instructor can teach you how to shoot. The basic mechanics of shooting are really pretty simple. Uh, you know, if, if you can read and write, and you can turn on your little mobile device and listen to this <laughs> to this radio show, then you can probably figure out how to load and, you know, point and press the trigger. That's not all that hard. How isn't that hard? And how is only the first step? If you want to not only survive, but you want to win, if you want to be the victor in a violent encounter, it doesn't do you any good to survive and then end up in prison. It doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do your family any good. It doesn't do you good to win your gunfight and then make stupid mistakes that end up landing you in jail or you lose your house because you get fined, you know, a hundred thousand dollars by the judge. You don't want to do that. It doesn't do you any good. Yes, you want to, you're alive. Great. Go team. But you want to be the victor. You want to be the winner. You don't just want to survive. And, uh, you know, people that are living under the overpass in your, you know, local big city, they're surviving. Do you want to be like them and just survive? No. So when it comes to firearms training and when it comes to the most serious application of a firearm, defending your own life, using a firearm to defend your own life, you don't need to just learn how. You need to learn how. And you need to learn when. Okay, I know how. Great. Check. Check that block off. When? When am I justified in using it? When can I? When I'm not when am I not allowed to? All right, we do that. We learn the how. We learn the when. Well, what is the next big one? And the next big one is one that you almost you'll rarely find it because People don't want to talk about it. People want to talk about how cool and, and gee whiz and ninja it is to go out and shoot super fast and burn down targets. And that's great. And we love doing that. But if you have to use a firearm to defend your own life against another human being, against a vicious attack, there's the how, there's the when, and then there's the what now. Okay, I did it. Go team. I, you know, I'm alive. Bad guy's down on the ground. What now? 
You can't just, you know, rip off a cool catchphrase, you know, grab Bruce Willis and walk off screen. It doesn't work like that. The what now will determine whether or not you're viewed as a justifiable, no kidding, good guy or whether or not you're viewed as a suspect or whether or not you're viewed as also being culpable and you end up either in jail or impoverished because it costs you a hundred thousand dollars. So it's the how, when, and what now. Those are the things that you need to learn and you can't make that up as you go. Take your butt and get into a professional shooting school. Now, where you go and when you go is 100% completely up to you. But if you're serious about it, if you're like, you're listening to my voice, if you are a student of the gun, you should crave that knowledge. You should seek that knowledge. You should be continually trying to add to the amount of knowledge and experience and information that you have. That's what makes life worth living. You know, if you get to the point where, okay, I know enough. All right, well, then you're done. You're done learning. But we don't want to be like that. I don't want to live my life where I decide, okay, you know, at age 35, I've learned all I can learn and I'm done. I'm just going to go on autopilot until I expire. I don't want to be on autopilot until I expire. I want to be continuously learning. I want to be a student of the gun. And the way you do that is to get your butt into a professional school. Take that first one and then... You know, that may open up your mind. A lot of times you get there thinking, I'm pretty good. I know what I'm talking about. And by the end of day one, you realize, wow, there was a lot that I never even thought of until I came here. Well, why is that? Because you can't train yourself. You can practice yourself, but you can't train yourself. So for all of you new guys out there, for all of you recent gun purchasers, for all of you guys out there thinking, well, I just went out and in a, you know, around December, I thought, oh, this is the time I need to get a gun or I need to get more than one gun. What am I going to do now? Buying the gear was your first step. Go team. You got it. Now what do you need to do? Well, you need to develop some skill. And how do we do that? Well, we just get our butts into a class. Uh, get on the Google machine. You know how to use it. Put in firearms training and uh, go from there. And, and most good, you know, most reputable schools, you say, well, which one should I go to? Well, most reputable schools will have, uh, you know, lists of, of alumni endorsements and, and so forth. Do your research. You're an adult. You're a smart guy. You're a smart girl. Do some research and find out where you want to go. Now, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us for another soon-to-be award-winning uh, episode of Student of the Gun Radio. We want to take a moment now to thank our good friends at Caltech Weapons. And I had a guy tell me today, he said, why aren't they making the PMR-30? And I told him, I said, because they're making parts for NASA. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They are making the PMR-30. They are also a victim of their own success. <laughs> they made a gun that's really popular. Now everybody wants them, and they can't keep up with the demand. That's just the way it is. I'm sorry. Put your order in uh, and get on the list. And if you want to wear probably the most comfortable in-the-waistband holster that is in existence today, and it's high quality, it's not a piece of uh, you know imported rip off junk get a crossbreed super tuck uh, you can go to crossbreedholsters.com and check out everything they have to offer now remember you're a beginner once but you should be a student for life <laughs> 